The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson Edited by Guillermo del Toro Chapter 1 No live organism can continue for long to exist sanely under conditions of absolute reality. Even larks and katydids are supposed, by some, to dream. Hill House, not sane, stood by itself against its hills, holding darkness within. It had stood so for eighty years and might stand for eighty more. Within, walls continued upright, bricks met neatly, floors were firm and doors were sensibly shut. Silence lay steadily against the wood and stone of Hill House, and whatever walked there, walked alone. Dr. John Montague was a doctor of philosophy. He had taken his degree in anthropology, feeling obscurely that in this field he might come closest to his true vocation, the analysis of supernatural manifestations. He was scrupulous about the use of his title because, his investigations being so utterly unscientific, he hoped to borrow an air of respectability, even scholarly authority, from his education. It had cost him a good deal, in money and pride, since he was not a begging man, to rent Hill House for three months. But he expected absolutely to be compensated for his pains by the sensation following upon the publication of his definitive work on the causes and effects of psychic disturbances in a house commonly known as Haunted. He had been looking for an honestly haunted house all his life, When he heard of Hill House, he had been at first doubtful, then hopeful, then indefatigable. He was not the man to let go of Hill House once he had found it. Dr. Montague's intentions with regard to Hill House derived from the methods of the intrepid 19th century ghost hunters. He was going to go and live in Hill House and see what happened there. It was his intention, at first, to follow the example of the anonymous lady who went to stay at Bellican House and ran a summer-long house party for skeptics and believers, with croquet and ghost-watching as the outstanding attractions. But skeptics, believers, and good croquet players are harder to come by today. Dr. Montague was forced to engage assistants. Perhaps the leisurely ways of Victorian life lent themselves more agreeably to the devices of psychic investigation. Or perhaps the painstaking documentation of phenomena has largely gone out as a means of determining actuality. At any rate, Dr. Montague had not only to engage assistants, but to search for them. Because he thought of himself as careful and conscientious, he spent considerable time looking for his assistants. He combed the records of the psychic societies, the back files of sensational newspapers, the reports of parapsychologists, and assembled a list of names of people who had, in one way or another, at one time or another, no matter how briefly or dubiously, been involved in abnormal events. From his list, he first eliminated the names of people who were dead. When he had then crossed off the names of those who seemed to him publicity seekers, of subnormal intelligence, or unsuitable because of a clear tendency to take the center of the stage, he had a list of perhaps a dozen names. Each of these people then received a letter from Dr. Montague, extending an invitation to spend all or part of a summer at a comfortable country house. Old, but perfectly equipped with plumbing, electricity, central heating, and cleaned mattresses. The purpose of their stay, the letter stated clearly, was to observe and explore the various unsavory stories which had been circulated about the house for most of its eighty years of existence. Dr. Montague's letters did not say openly that Hill House was haunted, because Dr. Montague was a man of science, and until he had actually experienced a psychic manifestation in Hill House, he would not trust his luck too far. Consequently, his letters had a certain ambiguous dignity calculated to catch at the imagination of a very special sort of reader. To his dozen letters, Dr. Montague had four replies, the other eight or so candidates having presumably moved and left no forwarding address, or possibly having lost interest in the supernatural, or even perhaps never having existed at all. To the four who replied, Dr. Montague wrote again, naming a specific day when the house would be officially regarded as ready for occupancy, and enclosing detailed directions for reaching it, since, as he was forced to explain, information about finding the house was extremely difficult to get, particularly from the rural community which surrounded it. 
On the day before he was to leave for Hill House, Dr. Montague was persuaded to take into his select company a representative of the family who owned the house, and a telegram arrived from one of his candidates, backing out with a clearly manufactured excuse. Another never came or wrote, perhaps because of some pressing personal problem which had intervened. The other two came. Eleanor Vance was 32 years old when she came to Hill House. The only person in the world she genuinely hated, now that her mother was dead, was her sister. She disliked her brother-in-law and her five-year-old niece. And she had no friends. This was owing largely to the eleven years she had spent caring for her invalid mother, which had left her with some proficiency as a nurse and an inability to face strong sunlight without blinking. She could not remember ever being truly happy in her adult life. Her years with her mother had been built up devotedly around small guilts and small reproaches, constant weariness and unending despair. Without ever wanting to become reserved and shy, she had spent so long alone, with no one to love, that it was difficult for her to talk, even casually to another person without self-consciousness and an awkward inability to find words. Her name had turned up on Dr. Montague's list because one day, when she was 12 years old and her sister was 18, and their father had been dead for not quite a month, showers of stones had fallen on their house, without any warning or indication of purpose or reason, dropping from the ceilings, rolling loudly down the walls, breaking windows and now pattering maddeningly on the roof. The stones continued intermittently for three days, during which time Eleanor and her sister were less unnerved by the stones than by the neighbors and sightseers who had gathered daily outside the front door, and by their mother's blind, hysterical insistence that all of this was due to malicious, backbiting people on the block who had had it in for her ever since she came. After three days, Eleanor and her sister were removed to the house of a friend, and the stones stopped falling. Nor did they ever return. Although Eleanor and her sister and her mother went back to living in the house, and the feud with the entire neighborhood was never ended. The story had been forgotten by everyone except the people Dr. Montague consulted. It had certainly been forgotten by Eleanor and her sister, each of whom had supposed at the time that the other was responsible. During the whole underside of her life, ever since her first memory, Eleanor had been waiting for something like Hill House. Caring for her mother, lifting a cross old lady from her chair to her bed, setting out endless little trays of soup and oatmeal, stealing herself to the filthy laundry. Eleanor had held fast to the belief that someday, something would happen. She had accepted the invitation to Hill House by return mail, although her brother-in-law had insisted upon calling a couple of people to make sure that this doctor fellow was not aiming to introduce Eleanor to savage rites not unconnected with the matters Eleanor's sister deemed it improper for an unmarried young woman to know. Perhaps, Eleanor's sister whispered in the privacy of the marital bedroom, perhaps Dr. Montague, if that really was his name after all, Perhaps Dr. Montague, if that really was his name after all, perhaps this Dr. Montague used these women for some, well, experiments. You know, experiments, the way they do. Eleanor's sister dwelt richly upon experiments she had heard these doctors did. Eleanor had no such ideas, or, having them, was not afraid. Eleanor, in short would have gone anywhere. Theodora. That was as much name as she used. Her sketches were signed Theo. And on her apartment door, and the window of her shop, and her telephone listing, and her pale stationery, and to the bottom of the lovely photograph of her which stood on the mantel, the name was only Theodora. Theodora was not at all like Eleanor. Duty and conscious were, for Theodora, attributes which belonged properly to Girl Scouts. Theodora's world was of delight and soft colors. She had come onto Dr. Montague's list because, going laughing into the laboratory, bringing with her a rush of floral perfume, she had somehow been able, amused and excited over her own incredible skill, to identify correctly 18 cards out of 20, 15 cards out of 20, 19 cards out of 20, held up by an assistant out of sight and hearing. 
The name of Theodora shone in the records of the laboratory and so came inevitably to Dr. Montague's attention. Theodora had been entertained by Dr. Montague's first letter and answered it out of curiosity. Perhaps the wakened knowledge in Theodora, which told her the names of symbols on cards held out for sight, urged her on her way toward Hill House, and yet fully intended to decline the invitation. Yet, perhaps the stirring, urgent sense again, when Dr. Montague's confirming letter arrived, Theodora had been tempted and had somewhat plunged blindly, wantonly, into a violent quarrel with the friend with whom she shared an apartment. Things were said on both sides, which only time could eradicate. Theodora had deliberately and heartlessly smashed the lovely little figurine her friend had carved of her, and her friend had cruelly ripped to shreds the volume of Alfred de Musset, which had been a birthday present from Theodora. Taking particular pains with the page which bore Theodora's loving, teasing inscription. These acts were, of course, unforgettable, and before they could laugh over them together, time would have to go by. Theodora had written that night, accepting Dr. Montague's invitation, and departed in cold silence the next day. Luke Sanderson was a liar, he was also a thief. His aunt, who was the owner of Hill House, was fond of pointing out that her nephew had the best education, the best clothes, the best taste, and the worst companions of anyone she had ever known. She would have leaped at any chance to put him safely away for a few weeks. The family lawyer was prevailed upon to persuade Dr. Montague that the house could on no account be rented to him for his purposes without the confining presence of a member of the family during his stay. And perhaps at their first meeting, the doctor perceived in Luke a kind of strength or cat-like instinct for self-preservation, which made him almost as anxious as Mrs. Sanderson to have Luke with him in the house. At any rate, Luke was amused, his aunt grateful, and Dr. Montague more than satisfied. Mrs. Sanderson told the family lawyer that at any rate there was really nothing in the house Luke could steal. The old silver there was of some value, she told the lawyer, but it represented an almost insuperable difficulty for Luke. It required energy to steal it and transform it into money. Mrs. Sanderson did Luke an injustice. Luke was not at all likely to make it off with the family silver, or Dr. Montague's watch, or Theodora's bracelet. His dishonesty was largely confined to taking petty cash from his aunt's pocketbook and cheating at cards. He was also apt to sell the watches and cigarette cases given him, fondly and with pretty blushes by his aunt's friends. Someday Luke would inherit Hill House, but he had never thought to find himself living in it. I just don't think she should take the car is all, Eleanor's brother-in-law said stubbornly. It's half my car, Eleanor said. I helped pay for it. I just don't think she should take it is all, her brother-in-law said. He appealed to his wife. It isn't fair she should have the use of it for the whole summer and us have to do without. Carrie drives it all the time, and I never even take it out of the garage, Eleanor said. Besides, you'll be in the mountains all summer, and you can't use it there. Carrie, you know you won't use the car in the mountains. But suppose poor little Linny got sick or something, and we needed a car to get her to a doctor. It's half my car, Eleanor said. I mean to take it. Suppose even Carrie got sick. Suppose we couldn't get a doctor and we needed to go to a hospital. I want it. I mean to take it. I don't think so. Carrie spoke slowly, deliberately. We don't know where you're going, do we? You haven't seen fit to tell us very much about all this, have you? I don't think I can see my way clear to letting you borrow my car. It's half my car. No, Carrie said. You may not. Right. Eleanor's brother-in-law nodded. We need it, like Carrie says. Carrie smiled slightly. I'd never forgive myself, Eleanor, if I lent you the car and something happened. How do we know we can trust this doctor fellow? You're still a young woman, after all, and the car is worth a good deal of money. Well now, Carrie, I did call Homer in the credit office, and he said this fellow was in good standing at some college or other, Carrie said, smiling. Of course, there is every reason to suppose that he is a decent man. But Eleanor does not choose to tell us where she is going, or how to reach her if we want the car back. Something could happen, and we might never know. Even if Eleanor... She went on delicately, addressing her teacup. 
even if Eleanor is prepared to run off to the ends of the earth at the invitation of any man, there is still no reason why she should be permitted to take my car with her. It's half my car. Suppose little Linny got sick up there in the mountains, with nobody around. No doctor? In any case, Eleanor, I am sure that I am doing what Mother would have thought best. Mother had confidence in me, and would certainly never have approved me letting you run wild going off heaven knows where in my car. Or suppose even I got sick up there, and I am sure Mother would have agreed with me, Eleanor. Besides, Eleanor's brother-in-law said, struck by a sudden idea. How do we know she'd bring it back in good condition? There has to be a first time for everything, Eleanor told herself. She got out of the taxi very early in the morning, trembling because by now, perhaps, her sister and her brother-in-law might be stirring with the first faint proddings of suspicion. She took her suitcase quickly out of the taxi, while the driver lifted out the cardboard carton which had been on the front seat. Eleanor overtipped him, wondering if her sister and brother-in-law were following were perhaps even now turning into the street and telling each other, There she is, just as we thought. The thief. There she is. She turned in haste to go into the huge city garage where the car was kept, glancing nervously toward the ends of the street. She crashed into a very little lady, sending packages in all directions, and saw with dismay a bag upset and break on the sidewalk, spilling out broken pieces of cheesecake, tomato slices, a hard roll. Damn you! Damn you! The little lady screamed, her face pushed up close to Eleanor's. I was taking it home! Damn you! Damn you! I'm so sorry, Eleanor said. She bent down, but it did not seem possible to scoop up the fragments of tomato and cheesecake and shove them somehow back into the broken bag. The old lady was scowling down and snatching up her other packages before Eleanor could reach them, and at last Eleanor rose, smiling in convulsive apology. I'm really so sorry, she said. Damn you, the little old lady said, but more quietly. I was taking it home for my little lunch, and now, thanks to you, perhaps I could pay. Eleanor took hold of her pocketbook, and the little lady stood very still and thought. I couldn't take your money, just like that, she said at last. I didn't buy the things, you see. They were left over. She snapped her lips angrily. You should have seen the hand they had, she said, but someone else got that. And the chocolate cake, and the potato salad, and and the little candies and the paper dishes. I was too late on everything, and now... She and Eleanor both glanced down at the mess on the sidewalk, and the little lady said, So, you see, I, I couldn't just take money. Not money just from your hand, not for something that was left over. May I buy you something to replace this, then? I'm in a terrible hurry, but if we could find some place that's open... The little old lady smiled wickedly. I've still got this, anyway, she said, and she hugged one package tight. You may pay my taxi fare home, she said. Then no one else will be likely to knock me down. Gladly, Eleanor said and turned to the taxi driver, who had been waiting, interested. Can you take this lady home, she asked. A couple of dollars would do it, the little lady said. Not including the tip for this gentleman, of course. Being as small as I am, she explained daintily, it's quite a hazard, quite a hazard indeed, people knocking you down. Still, it's a genuine pleasure to find one as willing as you to make up for it. Sometimes the people who knock you down never turn once to look. With Eleanor's help, she climbed into the taxi with her packages, and Eleanor took two dollars and fifty cent piece. And Eleanor took two dollars and a fifty-cent piece from her pocketbook and handed them to the little lady, who clutched them tight in her tiny hand. All right, sweetheart, the taxi said. All right, sweetheart, the taxi said. All right, all right, sweetheart, the taxi driver said. Where do we go? The little lady chuckled. I'll tell you after we start, she said. And then to Eleanor. Good luck to you, dearie. Watch out from now on how you go knocking people down. Goodbye, Eleanor said, and I'm really very sorry. That's fine, then, the little lady said, waving at her as the taxi pulled away from the curb. I'll be praying for you, dearie. Well, Eleanor thought, staring at the taxi. There's one person, anyway, who will be praying for me. One person, anyway.
It was the first genuinely shining day of summer, a time of year which brought Eleanor always to aching memories of her early childhood, when it had seemed to be summer all the time. She could not remember a winter before her father's death on a cold, wet day. She had taken to wondering lately, during these swift, counted years, what had been done with all those wasted summer days. How could she have spent them so wantonly? I am foolish, she told herself early every summer. I am very foolish. I am grown up now, and know the values of things. Nothing is ever really wasted, she believed sensibly, even one's childhood. And then, each year, one summer morning, the warm wind would come down the city street where she walked and she would be touched with this little cold thought. I have let more time go by. Yet this morning, driving the little car which she and her sister owned together, apprehensive lest they might still realize that she had come after all and just taken it away, going docilely along the street, following the lines of traffic, stopping when she was bidden and turning when she could, she smiled out at the sunlight slanting along the street and thought, I am going. I am going. I have finally taken a step. Always before, when she had her sister's permission to drive the little car, she had gone cautiously, moving with extreme care to avoid even the slightest scratch or mar which might irritate her sister. But today, with her carton on the back seat and her suitcase on the floor, her gloves and pocketbook and light coat on the seat beside her, the car belonged entirely to her, a little contained world all her own. I am really going. I am really going she thought. At the last traffic light in the city, before she turned to go onto the great highway out of town, she stopped, waiting, and slid Dr. Montague's letter out of her pocketbook. I will not even need a map, she thought. He must be a very careful man. Route 39 to Ashton, the letter said, and then turn left onto Route 5 going west. Follow this for a little less than thirty miles and you will come to a small village of Hillsdale. Go through Hillsdale to the corner with a gas station on the left and a church on the right, and turn left here onto what seems to be a narrow country road. You will be going up into the hills and the road is very poor. Follow this road to the end, about six miles, and you will come to the gates of Hill House. I am making these directions so detailed because it is inadvisable to stop in Hillsdale to ask your way. The people there are rude to strangers and openly hostile to anyone inquiring about Hill House. I am very happy that you will be joining us in Hill House and will take great pleasure in making your acquaintance on Thursday the 21st of June. The light changed. She turned onto the highway and was free of the city. No one, she thought, can catch me now. They don't even know which way I'm going. She had never driven far alone before. The notion of dividing her lovely journey into miles and hours was silly. She saw it, bringing her car with precision between the line of the road and the line of trees beside the road, as a passage of moments, each one new, carrying her along with them, taking her down a path of incredible novelty to a new place. The journey itself was her positive action, her destination vague, unimagined, perhaps non-existent. She meant to savor each turn of her traveling, loving the road and the trees and the houses and the small, ugly towns teasing herself with the notion that she might take it into her head to stop just anywhere and never leave again. She might pull her car to the side of the highway, though that was not allowed, she told herself she would be punished if she really did, and to leave it behind while she wandered off past the trees into the soft, welcoming country beyond. She might wander till she was exhausted, chasing butterflies or following a stream, and then come at nightfall to the hut of some poor woodcutter who would offer her shelter. She might make her home forever in East Barrington or Desmond or the incorporated village of Burke. She might never leave the road at all, but just hurry on and on until the wheels of the car were worn to nothing, and she had come to the end of the world. And, she thought... I might just be going along to Hill House, where I am expected and where I am being given shelter and room and board and a small token salary in consideration of forsaking my commitments and involvements in the city and running away to see the world. I wonder what Dr. Montague is like. I wonder what Hill House is like. I wonder who else will be there. She was very well away from the city now, 
watching for the turning onto Route 39, that magic thread of road Dr. Montague had chosen for her, out of all the roads in the world, to bring her safely to him and to Hill House. No other road could lead her from where she was to where she wanted to be. Dr. Montague was confirmed, made infallible, under the sign which pointed the way to Route 39 was another sign saying, Ashton, 121 miles. The road, her intimate friend now, turned and dipped, going around turns where surprises waited. Once a cow, regarding her over a fence, once an incurious dog, down into hollows where small towns lay, past fields and orchards. On the main street of one village she passed a vast house, pillared and walled, with shutters over the windows and a pair of stone lions guarding the steps, and she thought that perhaps she might live there, dusting the lions each morning and patting their heads good night. Time is beginning this morning in June, she assured herself, but it is a time that is strangely new and of itself. In these few seconds I have lived a lifetime in a house with two lions in front, Every morning I swept to the porch and dusted the lions, and every evening I patted their heads good night. And once a week I washed their faces and manes and paws with warm water and soda, and cleaned between their teeth with a swab. Inside the house, the rooms were tall and clear with shining floors and polished windows. A little dainty old lady took care of me, moving starchily with a silver tea service on a tray and bringing me a glass of elderberry wine each evening for my health's sake. I took my dinner alone in the long, quiet dining room at the gleaming table, and between the tall windows the white paneling of the walls shone in the candlelight. I dined upon a bird, and radishes from the garden, and homemade plum jam. When I slept, it was under a canopy of white organdy, and a nightlight guarded me from the hall. People bowed to me on the streets of town because everyone was proud of my lions. When I died, she had left the town far behind now and was going past dirty, closed lunch stands and torn signs. There had been a fair somewhere near here once, long ago. With motorcycle races, the signs still carried fragments of words. Dare, one of them read, and another, evil. And she laughed at herself. Perceiving how she sought out omens everywhere, the word is daredevil, Eleanor. Daredevil drivers. And she slowed her car down because she was driving too fast and might reach Hill House too soon. At one spot, she stopped altogether beside the road to stare in disbelief and wonder. Along the road for perhaps a quarter of a mile, she had been passing and admiring a row of splendid tended oleanders, blooming pink and white in a steady row. Now she had come to the gateway they protected, and past the gateway the trees continued. The gateway was no more than a pair of ruined stone pillars, with the road leading away between them into empty fields. She could see that the oleander trees cut away from the road and ran up each side of a great square, and she could see all the way to the farther side of the square, which was a line of oleander trees seemingly going along a little river. Inside the oleander square there was nothing, No house, no building, nothing but the straight road going across and ending at the stream. Now what was here, she wondered. What was here and is gone, or what was going to be here and never came. Was it going to be a house, or a garden, or an orchard? Were they driven away forever, or are they coming back? Oleanders are poisonous, she remembered. Could they be here guarding something? Will I, she thought. Will I get out of my car and go between the ruined gates and then, once I am in the magic oleander square, find that I have wandered into a fairyland, protected poisonously from the eyes of people passing? Once I have stepped between the magic gateposts, will I find myself through the protective barrier, the spell broken? I will go into a sweet garden with fountains and low benches and roses trained over arbors and find one path, jeweled perhaps with rubies and emeralds, soft enough for a king's daughter to walk upon with her little sandaled feet. And it will lead me directly to the palace which lies under a spell. I will walk up low stone steps, past stone lions guarding, and into a courtyard where a fountain plays, and the queen waits, weeping, for the princess to return. 
She will drop her embroidery when she sees me, and cry out to the palace servants, stirring at last after their long sleep, to prepare a great feast, because the enchantment is ended and the palace is itself again. And we shall live happily ever after. No, of course not, she thought, turning to start her car again.